Thank you. Wow, what a joy it is to be here. How are we all doing today anyway? Great, what a treat. I've been so looking forward to being here this morning and sharing some perspective with you. Uh, by the way, is anybody here use a little more healing in your life right now? Yeah, yeah, oh, good. Well, you are in the right place because that's what this morning is all about. How to experience more of that healing power of God. And that's some ideas I'd like to share with you about that. Uh, especially on the point of view of perspective, how perspective can make all the difference. I chuckle when I think about a story that my wife told me about a year ago. Back home where we live, we have uh, what's called Badger Mountain, which is more like a hill, but sounds good anyway. And uh, a lot of people like to hike up Badger Mountain. So my wife was scheduled to hike up Badger with one of her best friends who lives at the foothill of Badger Mountain. And on the day of the hike, her, her friend texts over to her and says, oh, I don't know, I think we're going to have to cancel the hike today. The weather's looking really bad. Well, we live about a mile away, and my wife wasn't so convinced of this. And she looks out the front yard over to the Badger, and there's this storm cloud right over the top of Badger Mountain, but it's just wide open blue sky beyond. And so she texts back, no, I don't think so. I think it's going to be a great day. Let me show you what I see. So she snapped the picture and uh, sent it off to, to her friend who looked at it and, and saw the blue sky and said, oh, oh no, that's not what I see. Let me show you what I see. <laughs> and so out her back window, she snaps a picture and all she can see is this dark black storm cloud overhead. That's all she can see. Sends it back to Kathy and <laughs> they end up going on their hike and that storm cloud just, just passed right on by. It's a wide open, beautiful, sunny day for a hike. And, and in the end, they compare their pictures on their cell phones and the blue sky, the storm cloud, and, and rightfully conclude that, well, perspective is everything. And it certainly is, whether you're deciding to hike up a mountain or when turning to God in prayer. We all have storm clouds coming our way, usually, different times in our life. They take all kinds of forms. Maybe it is a, um, a financial trouble you're dealing with, or, or maybe a, a relationship problem or conflict. Maybe a health issue that needs to be resolved. Well, no matter what that storm cloud is, though, there's always a greater and grander view to take in. And that's where I want to go with you today. That greater and grander view is no matter what that storm cloud looks like, God's power and presence is always there and always remains the same. And I'd like to share with you how a Christian science perspective can help you see that grander view of God's power there and help you resolve whatever that trouble is you're facing at the moment. So now I do understand there are a lot of misunderstandings about what Christian science is and what it is not in the public consciousness. And I'd like to clear up several of those misunderstandings as I move along here. So just to be clear, we'll just start right out from the beginning. When I say Christian science, what do I mean? Well, it's how Jesus Christ healed when he went to God in prayer. That there is a science there to the healing works of Christ to be discerned and understood. That Mary Baker Eddy, the one who discovered Christian science, saw that science at work in the life of Jesus Christ, gain an understanding of it, and successfully put it into practice. It is a prayer-based method of healing that anybody can learn, even you. Now, on the other hand, what is it not? Christian science is not some type of mind over matter method. It's, it's not uh, faith healing. It's uh, not close your eyes, you know, grit your teeth and hope for the best. It's not positive thinking, although positive thinking is better than negative thinking. <laughs> it's, it's not another type of meditation. It's definitely not Scientology. It is not a human mind cure. It is not medical or pharmaceutical. So what is it? Christian science is about beholding and understanding the reality of God getting an understanding of this infinite love that is always here to help us, to support us, sustain us, even heal us, to dissolve those storm clouds of the moment that seem so ominous and restore peace, order, harmony, love, even health. It's a perspective that heals. And I'll give you some examples of how this works as we move along here. Now, I mentioned to you Mary Baker Eddy, the one who discovered Christian science. She, from a very young age, had this deep yearning to understand God and know God. 
She was raised on the Bible by her parents who were very devout Christians, and the, I think the children read from the Bible every day. You know, it was just a family habit. And she, she loved the Bible as she grew up. She loved what she found in here, the teachings, the stories, and also the promises of healing meant more and more to her over the years. And she wanted to know, how, how can I turn to God and find healing on a regular basis? And she found answers to those questions along the way. She had a major incentive to find those answers. Uh, for one, she suffered from a number of health problems that just wouldn't yield. And she tried anything that seemed to offer hope. The, the medical community had nothing there to offer her. She tried other forms of healing. Oh, she tried um, like, um, oh, hydropathy, you know, she tried diets, she tried uh, mind cure techniques, homeopathy. Once in a while she'd find relief, but the pain and suffering would return, and here we go again. But through it all, she never lost her faith in God. And uh, finally, after decades, she had a life transformative experience, changed everything, and finally set her on course to really understand how to heal, like Jesus promised you can heal when you turn to God. And in brief, what happened was she suffered this crippling injury um, that paralyzed her, extreme pain, a lot of internal injuries. People around her didn't know whether she'd even live through it. Laid up in bed, there she was. Nobody had any, any way to help her. And, but again, she asked for her Bible, as it would have been accustomed. She went to God in prayer, just quietly, thinking about the healing works of Jesus and the promises of healing. And as she was listening and praying, there's this dramatic influx of spiritual light into her thinking that changed everything. Just lifted her thought right up there to what she later said was, I saw, I saw life in spirit. And the effect on her experience was, was so profound, she was instantly recovered from this physical suffering. She, she could get up and walk around. It seemed like a miracle, um, and it was quite impressive, but that really wasn't the big deal for her. It was this insight, this, this revelation of life and spirit that really caught her attention. And she wanted to know what was the connection between life and spirit and the physical healing that she just experienced. Was there something more there to understand? She felt there was. And there was. What did she see there that was so significant? Life and spirit. What does that mean? Well, essentially, what she saw was, I am living my eternal spiritual life right now. I don't know. Can you get your arms around that? Does anybody here believe in eternal life? That there's more to life than this? Okay. Most of your hands are going up. All right. Well, let me ask you a question. When does your eternal life start? <laughs> Hers never starts. Sort of a trick question, isn't it? I mean, you gotta think about that one. Wait a minute here. Uh, you know, the very definition of eternal is no beginning and no end, right? It's like a circle, it just is. It does not have a starting point. And as she started to think this through, she began to see, oh, this is what Jesus Christ understood. We're living our eternal spiritual life right now. It's a matter of perspective. Jesus did not teach you have to die first and then you go to heaven. He did not teach that. When people were suffering and they were sick, he didn't say, oh, you know, I'm sorry that life has brought you this calamity, uh, you know, but once you die, then you can go to heaven. <laughs> we'll make the, best of the most of it, you know, in the meantime. He didn't teach that. No, he taught God's love and God's care right here, right now. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His sense of heaven was a here and now experience. And Mrs. Eddy began to see, if you believe in eternal life, you have to accept that you're already living it. You already have it. And everything that eternal life includes. Consciousness, reason, intelligence, wisdom, um, the ability to think clearly, um, hearing, vision, all your faculties, mobility, everything that makes you you, including health, is a part of who you are right now as a spiritual child of God. It's a matter of perspective, of having the perspective that Jesus had. What did he teach about heaven? Um, well, one thing he taught was the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? How close is your hand? It's really close, isn't it? In fact, mine's attached. I can even use it. His sense of heaven was right here, right now. He did not teach delayed good. He did not teach that, you gotta wait till you die and things get better. He brought the kingdom of heaven right into people's experience right here on earth. 
This is how healing happens. That's what healing's all about. Experiencing more of God's love and care right where you are this moment. It was a perspective issue. He also taught about heaven. The kingdom of God is within you. Whoa. Think about that. Within you. The kingdom of heaven. Well, that's where God's in control, right? The kingdom of heaven is God's universe. God's in control. It's all good there. It's all within you. Within what, though? What does that mean, within what? Within the brain, the heart, your blood, the physical body, the house you live in, Southern California? No, <laughs> no not within anything or any place material. The kingdom of God is within spiritual consciousness. Within spiritual consciousness. And again, it's a perspective issue. Jesus Christ had this spiritual consciousness. This was part of his mission, to help humanity understand the reality about God and God's goodness and our relationship to God, that it's a here and now thing. It's not a wait until you die experience. It's to be experienced now, right where you were. Jesus Christ was constantly looking and thinking beyond the physical to the spiritual, wherever he went, whatever he did. And he was bringing it out for people's benefit. Oh, take the, the widow of Nain story, right? The widow of Nain, her son dies. And he's all prepared to be buried. And the, the funeral procession is carrying him out of town on a stretcher. Jesus comes by and, and he stops the procession. He walks up, walks up to this stretcher, this, this boy laid out there, all prepared to be buried. And, and he talks to him. Young man, I say to thee, who was he talking to? I mean, seriously. It was just a dead body. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the boy. He could see that boy from a spiritual point of view. Young man, I say to thee, arise. And the boy responds. He gets up and he walks. He's alive. Jesus could see him from God's point of view. He had that heavenly perspective that enabled to bring the spiritual more out in the human experience and bring it to a higher place. Same with Lazarus. How long did Lazarus lay in the tomb? Four days. That is a long time. Jesus comes by. Hey, Lazarus, come on out of there. Who was he talking to? I mean, really? Can you imagine what people around him were thinking? Who is he talking to? You know, he was talking to Lazarus. He saw Lazarus alive and well. He had the spiritual perspective, God's perspective. Lazarus responded. He came out of there alive. Loose him and let him go. Loose him from your false material beliefs and see him from God's point of view. He's alive and well. Jesus was doing this all the time, looking beyond the material to the spiritual and bringing it out. And this is what Mrs. Eddy began to see, that we too can gain this same perspective from studying his works and seeing what he saw there. This was the missing link that brought it all together for her. She began to see that to Jesus Christ, there are not two realities. There's not a material reality over here and a spiritual reality over here. To Jesus Christ, there was one reality, and it was the spiritual. The material was just a temporal phenomenon of the human mind that comes and goes like a, like a shadow in the night. And this is why Jesus taught his followers to don't put your hopes and faith in things of this world. Don't build up castles in this world because you will be disappointed. Don't put your faith and your love in things that rust and corrupt and decay, that can be taken from you, here today, gone tomorrow, because they're not real substance. That's not where the real good stuff is. It's in the things of the spirit. Seek the things of love, of life and truth, and then you'll be headed in the right direction. This was the missing link that brought it all together for Mrs. Eddy the perspective that was helping her understand how Jesus Christ healed. It was the coming of the comforter that Jesus Christ promised would come and teach you all things. There's just one reality, and it's spiritual. And this perspective heals. And she started putting this life and spirit into practice, and she was able to heal herself of these long-standing health problems. And uh, then she was healing people all around her. She was healing them of some of the worst forms of human suffering, just one at a time, blindness, 
deafness, the inability to walk. She healed people of uh, insanity, of severe drug addictions. She raised countless people from their deathbeds through this understanding of looking at them from a spiritual point of view. Life in spirit. Phenomenal healer. She took what she learned about how to do it and shared it with the world in the form of her major work, this book titled Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And if you've never read this book, you might want to grab yourself a copy, sit down with it, read it through, and th see what you might learn in here about looking at life from a spiritual point of view. It's quite a phenomenal work. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not a substitute for the Bible. There's just one Bible. But Science and Health is a, is a textbook uh, we all don't have to learn everything the hard way. There's some people out there who have had some really good experiences that we can learn from, and Mrs. Eddy is one of them. She had some phenomenally good experiences with her study of the Bible and shared what she learned in this book. You know, one lecture I gave, I had a, a woman share with me during the lecture. She said, Evan, this book saved my life. I was told by my doctor that I'd be dead in two or three months from advanced heart disease. There was nothing more they could do. But then somebody gave me this book, and I started to read it, and I got it. And it healed her of the heart disease. It healed her of asthma that she had struggled with for 40 years, of, of pain in her knee that she had to use a cane to get around with, and of a tumor that she was scheduled to have a major operation on. All of that was healed from her study of science and health. And, uh, and she said, and I'm alive and well. You know, she's been alive and well for over nine years now. She's thriving. And uh, she could really tell you a lot about how this book changed her life. But it can change your life, too. It's quite a, quite a book. Um, all right, life and spirit, perspective is key. Now, when people start learning about Christian science, they often have a lot of questions. And one of the big questions that comes up is, okay, well, you talk about life and spirit. Um, God is spiritual. God's universe is spiritual. But what about matter? What about this body? Feels pretty physical to me. You know, I gotta feed it, gotta clothe it. Uh, I believe I need medicine to keep it healthy. I have a car, I gotta put gas in it. My world looks very material. I don't know if I can relate to this life and spirit stuff or if it has any relevance to me at all. What about that? Great question. Needs an answer too. And there is an answer. And again, perspective is everything. The human eye looks out over the horizon and says, oh yeah, look, the earth is flat. But science says, oh, not really. Just look a little further and you'll start to see that it's really round. Well, the same with the physical senses. They look out and around and feel and touch and smell things. Oh yeah, my universe is all matter. It's all physical. But divine science or Christian science says, not really. You just need to look a little further and you'll start to see that it's really spiritual. It's a perspective thing. What we learn in Christian science is that we really live in a universe of mind, of divine mind, where things are thoughts and ideas are substance. That what we call material things, like mountains, trees, and valleys, and houses, cars, physical bodies, are really but limited human concepts of what exists in the divine mind as an idea. And the opportunity there is to think and see beyond the material thing to the idea behind it, to gain an understanding of that idea. And to the degree that you understand it, its blessings will come out in your human experience and take it to a better place. Jesus was doing this all the time, looking beyond the physical to the spiritual and then bringing it out. Take, for example, the story of the loaves and the fishes probably heard of that one. And so you, here you have uh, Jesus is out preaching in the desert and thousands and thousands of people have flocked from all over to come out to hear him. It's the end of a long day. Jesus is done, finished. The disciples are huddled around there wondering what to do with this mass of people here uh, who are hungry and starving and they have no food. Master, what shall we do? Send them away? <laughs> Jesus says, oh no, just go ahead and feed them. And they're thinking like, um... We just have a few loaves and a few fishes here, Master, you know. Well, was Jesus impressed by just a few loaves and a few fishes? No, what does he do? He goes to God in prayer, expresses gratitude, and then he says, well, hand out what you have. And so they do, and in the end, everybody's fed, and they have more left over in the end than they started with. 
Is that the way your budget works? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, huh? Well, that's the way Jesus' budget worked. Now, how did that happen? Why did Jesus see more than enough and the disciples saw not enough? What was the difference? Perspective. perspective. Absolutely. They both had opposite perspectives. Jesus <laughs> addressed this more than once to those around him. He said, hey, you have eyes. Can't you see? You have eyes. Can't you see? Jesus had the spiritual perspective. His thinking was in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was, for Jesus, reality was heaven. That was reality. This is temporal. Spirit, life and spirit is reality. That's where his thinking was. In the kingdom of heaven, there's always enough, right? Love blesses everyone equally and unconditionally and impartially. Everyone is equally loved. There's always enough for everyone. There's no shortage. That was Jesus' sense of reality. That's what he saw. That's what he was aware of. And that's what he knew was true right there, right then. The, the disciples, however, they were sizing everything up physically to what they could only see in matter. And they counted their fishes and their loaves and they saw not enough. Okay, they were still in the realm of matter with their thinking. It was the perspective that was different. And so when Jesus said, you have eyes, can't you see? Now there's just a deep yearning in there. Come on, you guys, see what I see. No, you have eyes. What he meant was you have spiritual sense. You have spiritual eyes. You have spiritual sense. Use it. Use it. We all have spiritual sense, by the way. Every single one of us. That's the way God created us. It's just built into your being. It is there. And, and when things don't seem to be going so well, you can make a conscious choice to get switched over into that channel called spiritual sense. You do it with your TV all the time. If you don't like the channel you're watching, you just switch the channel. Well, you can do it with your thinking. You can get switched onto that channel, G-O-D, when you're switched onto some other channel, okay? Spiritual sense. Mrs. Eddy talks about this in Science and Health. She wrote, what is termed material sense can report only a mortal temporary sense of things, whereas spiritual sense can bear witness only to truth. To material sense, the unreal is the real until this sense is corrected by Christian science. And what she means by Christian science there is an understanding of how God governs the universe spiritually. Okay? So the material sense, it just takes in a temporary sense of things. Spiritual sense sees further into the kingdom of heaven. Material sense is like dense fog in the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever been in dense fog? Yes. You have dense fog down here? I'm sure. Okay. I'm just going to assume you've all had a dense fog experience. All right. And let's say it's in a familiar landscape, a place that you know well. So this heavy fog settles in. You can't even see six or eight feet in front of you. But you know where things are because you've been there before on a clear day. You know there's a hill over there, there's trees over there, there's a path winding off into the distance. You know where these things are. You just can't see them because of the fog. Well, that's the way the material senses are in the kingdom of heaven. You're in the kingdom of heaven right now, right? It's within you, it's at hand, it's all around. You really couldn't be in a better place than you are right now at this moment. You have it all. You have all of God's love, all of God's care, all of God's provision is yours. It's just a matter of how fast are you ready to accept it, okay? But if you are trying to find it through the physical senses, it's like looking out into dense fog. You're not gonna see it. You know it's there. I've been told it's there. I've seen it before. But you won't see it because the physical senses do not comprehend the things of the spirit. However, if you're tuning into your spiritual sense of things and looking for these riches and abundance and health of God spiritually, you will find it. The fog will start to lift. The view will start to clear. And there it is. You see, God's universe is not material. It's spiritual. It has to be. God is spirit. Isn't that what Jesus taught? God is spirit. Well, spirit can only create out of its own name and nature. It only can create that which is spiritual. God's universe is spiritual. It's perspective. It's all about 
perspective, getting the right perspective. This is an important concept to understand when it comes to healing the body. Because like I mentioned earlier, it feels very physical, it looks very physical. But in truth, your individuality is spiritual, made in the likeness of God, and is whole and perfect right now. It's a matter of perspective. Let me give you an example. I have a good friend who over 20 years ago started to experience a lot of pain and uh, then eventually deformity in his fingers and um, over a two-year period and it just kept getting worse and worse to a critical condition. He was a very busy businessman so that was the sort of thing you know you sort of put off and hope it went away but it wasn't going away it was getting worse and he was a student of Christian science and so he knew there was a connection between what he thought and the health he experienced and that he could find spiritual healing through prayer. He took a time out from his busy business life there, sequestered himself away to get quiet with God and listen for some type of solution. And uh, he read a testimony of a woman who was suffering from arthritis and a lot of pain. And this woman uh, discovered that she had a lot of hatred in her thought toward others around her. And she equated that hatred as you know, mental pain, physical pain, all the same thing. And so she prayed to love her enemies and learn how to love more and let go of all that hatred and resentment. She was successful and she was healed of the, the hatred and the arthritis and the pain. And as my friend read that, his, his mental gears started clicking there and he did an honest self-assessment of his own state of thought and realized he was in a very similar condition. He was filled with bitter hatred. Um, uh, dark hatred, and it was m monopolizing his thinking every single day with some business associates, one guy in particular. And uh, he started to realize, hey, that's the real pain issue in my life here. It's all this hatred and resentment and bitterness I'm carrying around here. And, uh, and he also realized it, it all started, those, that um, bitterness all started about two years ago that when he had to start working with this particular individual, that seemed to be the source and cause of it. And so, you know, it all started to make sense. And he thought, okay, I gotta be healed of this. Uh, this healing needs to happen in my consciousness. And so he settled down with what Jesus taught about, love your enemies and live, you know, love unselfishly and forgive and, and all those rules that we learn. And he started putting them into practice. As soon as he committed himself to loving more and hating left, he immediately felt a release in the severe pain in his fingers. So he knew he was on the right track. So he kept that prayer up for the next several weeks and just constant progress, day after day, learning how to love others more, to not hold their shortcomings against them, to see the good in them and not the evil. Let God take care of that. My job is to love and to love and to love and to be the presence of God in every relationship that I'm a part of. And he was successful at that. He was able to finally start forgiving and loving more. And that relationship actually turned around and he started working successful deals with this, what seemed to be an arch enemy, you know, earlier. And um, in the same time, all the pain and deformity left his fingers and his hands returned back to normal. And, uh, and I like to share this, and that's well over 20 years now, it's been a permanent healing. Uh, but I like to share this healing because the condition appeared very physical and it felt very, very physical. But the solution was spiritual. And that's the wonderful thing about Christian science. It will help you get beyond the symptoms, the outward surface stuff, down to what's really going on in consciousness, what really needs to be addressed there in your life, and heal you from the inside out. That is the most ideal kind of healing there is. Another question that will often come up. Okay, so you talk about God and God is good and God is all powerful. God is all powerful good. A lot of religions teach that, right? <clears throat> but that doesn't jive with my experience. Now I see a lot of evil going on around me. In fact, I have a big old storm cloud right now dumping all kinds of misery and suffering into my life and I have to deal with it. A lot of suffering going on around. I just, I can't buy into this. Um, God is all good and all powerful if all this evil is going on. How do you reckon that? Great question, <clears throat> needs an answer. And there is an answer. In fact, this is where Christian science really excels. Because in Christian science, you never ignore evil, never. You look it right in the eye. And the purpose of your prayer is to gain such a clear understanding of God's all power and all presence that you can dissolve that claim of evil and reduce it right down to its native nothingness. But the key to doing this is to understand the truth about evil in the first place. 
which Jesus Christ taught very clearly. What do you say in John about, about, about the devil? The devil is a liar. a liar. Absolutely. The devil is a liar. There is no truth in him. Let's really think about that. The devil is a liar. The devil is a lie. Devil, evil, Satan, adversary, resistance, opposition, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing. It's a liar and there is no truth in it. So it's a lie. Whoa, you might be sitting there thinking, whoa, Evan, I can't, this is a tough one to get my, get my thought around. The devil, evil is a lie. Uh, you know, how could he make a statement like that? All you have to do is watch the evening news, open the newspaper, and there are examples of horrific evil going on all around the world all the time. How can you say evil is a lie? Well, you need to understand the context in which Jesus is making this teaching. It's not like he just pulled it out of the air and threw it out there because it sounded good. No, it grew out of the heart of his experience. Basically, all the forces of evil came crushing down on Jesus Christ in the form of the crucifixion with the intent to destroy him, to wipe him out, to eliminate him and the presence of his teachings from the face of the earth forever. That was the intent there. And Jesus consented. He allowed that to happen, to prove a point. And he proved his point when he walked out of that tomb alive three days later in his resurrection. He did that proving that evil is not the power it appears to be. It is a lie, and it is a liar. God comes out on top, always. God is omnipotent, supreme, reigns over all. And he did that not only for his own benefit, but for all of ours too, to help us see the unreality of evil. And I agree with you. Sometimes it looks really real. It looks really ominous and even very scary. But if you at least can get the right label on it, L-I-E, and back up from it, give yourself the time and space if you can to understand why, in light of God's all power and all presence, you'll start to see cracks. You'll start to find the weak spots. It'll start to disintegrate and fall apart because God is all-powerful good. Why is it so important to understand that evil is a lie? Because if you don't understand it's a lie, what are you liable to believe it to be? The truth. The truth. Yeah. Oh, man. Ouch. <laughs> Have you thought that one through? If you accept in the premise of your thinking that evil is true, do you know what kind of effect it has in your human experience? When things start to go wrong or go against you, things are not looking too good, it opens up thought to discouragement, to despondency, to frustration, to anger, because you've accepted in the basis of your thought that evil's real. So, if you, so you have accepted that it can overtake you, overpower you, and take over. And you might start thinking thoughts like, oh, wow, this is a tough one. Oh, man, I don't think I can deal with this. I'm not sure there's even any point of praying about this. I, I don't even know if God can deal with this. I probably, I, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to give up and quit. Those are all red flags signaling something's wrong with the premise of your thought there. And it all can be traced back to you've accepted evil as God. You've empowered evil as a reality. And those are the symptoms of that belief. And so you want to quickly get back there and change your premise. Wait a minute, there's only one God in my life and it's a good God, a God of love that is there to care for me, support me, and take care of me and give me what I need to triumph over this evil that I'm facing right now. This is a lie and I can overcome it with the truth. We have to be like David facing Goliath. That story, David and Goliath. Goliath, he was a behemoth of a brute, this monster mortal, dressed in the latest technology of weaponry. You know, he had it all, the shields and the spears and everything. And, and he was taunting all the armies of Israel. Come on down here and fight me. Oh, no way, they were running the other direction. Nobody wanted anywhere near Goliath. It would be instant death. Except for one humble shepherd boy. I'll go. <laughs> I'll do it. Little David. David. David was not afraid. Why? Because David knew his God. David knew Almighty God. 
He understood God. He'd seen God at work in his life. He was not afraid of Goliath. I'll take him on. Okay, go ahead. Nobody else wanted anything to do with it. Down to the battlefield, David goes, just in his little shepherd loincloth, his little packet of rocks there, and his slingshot. That's it. And his understanding of God. And that understanding of God was so clear, it kept his thinking clear and enabled him to discern the soft spot of Goliath. Key point. Takes his one rock, puts it in his sling, slings it around, phooey, bammo, bam, down goes Goliath. No problem. <laughs> David discerned the soft spot. This is what Christian science helps you do. There's always a soft spot. You may be facing a Goliath in your life right now. And we all have our Goliaths that we face. Seems ominous, seems, you know, oh man, how do I deal with this? There is a, always an exposed underbelly to evil. There's always a soft spot. And you sooner discern it when you're clear on the truth about good and evil. Keeping that clear understanding, God reigns supreme. God is all powerful good. It breaks the mesmerism or the hold that evil would try to have on your thinking. It breaks it. It enables you to have a clear state of thought to discern where that soft spot is so you know where to cast your stone of truth and topple it. And that soft spot is its unreality. It's a lie. Evil's a lie. When people start studying Christian science, they often have a lot of questions about what it looks like. What does the practice of Christian science look like in your everyday life? And one of the first questions that often pop up is, well, what if you're dealing with an emergency situation, a crisis, and something needs to happen fast, and your prayers aren't making the change happen as fast as it needs to? What do you do then? And I respond, well, I do what I always do. I would turn right to God and listen. You know, I'd pray and listen to that voice of wisdom to know what to do, and then follow what I hear. This is Eddie addresses this. Here on page, um, whoops, I got the wrong page here. I got page 444. She says, if Christian scientists ever fail to receive aid from their prayers at that moment, God will still guide them. God will still guide them into the right use of temporary and eternal means. God's always there. You do the same thing you always do. Pray and listen. And God will tell you what you need to do. And if there is a temporary kind of step you need to take to get it under control, then so be it. You know, you just listen to the voice of wisdom and you'll know what the intelligent, wise thing is to do under the situation that you're in. You know, in Christian science, we are, are not martyrs for our faith. You know, it's not about, um, this is what I believe, close my eyes, grit my teeth, and clench my fist. <clears throat> no, that's not what it is at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a very graceful kind of thing. It's all about learning more about God and putting what you understand about God into practice as you understand it. We, we follow through with what we're able to demonstrate. It's like learning any science. Like if you're starting to learn math, you know, and you're launching in, say, to multiplication and division, you don't jump to trigonometry first. You've got to first learn those basics, get those down, and then you're ready to keep advancing through the higher rules. And same with Christian science. You just launch in where you are, keep growing in your understanding of God, and it's just wonderful to see how God just has this way of providing everything you need along the way as you grow in your understanding. Another question comes up is, uh, oh, are you one of those people who don't go to doctors? Anybody ever heard that one? Yeah, I always back up when I hear that one. It makes me cringe because I do not think of myself that way. Um, are you one of those people who go to God in prayer? Now that one, I'll jump on. Yeah, that's me. That's what I've learned to do. It's really not a fair characterization. Um, don't go to doctors. A, Christian, a student of Christian science can do anything they want to. They're free to go to a doctor. They are free moral agents to make any choice they want to. And that's the wonderful thing about Christian science. It's only between you and God. There are no arbitrary rules that say you have to do this or you have to do that. None of that exists in Christian science. It's just you growing in your understanding of God and putting into practice what you understand to be true. Now, the person across the street who doesn't understand this and may be watching you in your practice uh, may come to this conclusion, oh, they don't go to the doctors because this is what happens when you learn about Christian science. Let's say uh, you have been in the habit of running to the doctor or running to the drugstore for every health problem that comes along. 
But then you learn about Christian science and that, wait a minute, you know, I can go to God in prayer and find healing. And so, you know, you're going through life, a problem hits you and you stop. And before you would have run down to the drugstore, but this time you say, wait a minute, you know, I'm learning about this prayer thing. I think I'm going to try this. And you go to God in prayer and you gain some new insight of you and your relationship to God and, and you feel a light turn on it and a healing happens. The pain goes away and you go, wow, that was pretty fun. That was, that was cool, you know? And then so, you know, you go through life another few more months and something else comes along, maybe another health problem. And in the past, you might've run down to the emergency room, but this time you stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm gonna try this prayer thing again, you know? And, you go, go to God and you gain some new insight of your relationship to God and you know, maybe a light turns on there and, you go, and, and the disease goes away. And Oh, wow, you know, I think I could get used to this. And it just becomes a routine in your life because it really is the most wonderful way to be healed, to be able to go to God in prayer and experience health freedom. And so you get into this practice, this routine of going to God in prayer. Now the neighbor across the street's watching it and he sees you're not running to the doctor anymore. You're not running down to the drugstore and they might conclude, oh, he's one of those people who don't go to doctors. But that's really not what's going on there. It's someone who has learned about the healing power of God. Okay, and it's quite a treasure. Now, another question that will come on the heels of that one is, okay, but what about using medicine with my practice of Christian science? You know, putting them both together. Does that sound like a good idea? Well, what needs to be understood there is that you have two different thought models, two different ways of thinking. In the medical world, thought for the most part is very matter focused, usually on, on a physical body, on a physical condition, on a disease, and then perhaps on a drug or some type of material prescription. It's very matter focused. In, in the Christian science healing model, thought is very spirit focused because the purpose of your prayer there is to really to understand things from God's point of view. What does God see here? What did God create in the first place? What am I spiritually? It's very spirit focused. So you have a matter model, a spirit model. It's two opposite ways of thinking. It's like trying to look left and trying to look right at exactly the same time. And the human mind can't do it. It's either one way or the other. So if you really want to maximize your ability to experience the healing power of God, the more you can get your thinking over here into the, into the spirit model and more focused on the realities of spirit, the more successful you will be when you go to God in prayer. Now, the next question that will come is, okay, I'm over here in the medical model and I'm taking medicines and uh, I would love to be healed spiritually, but I don't see any way I can quit taking these medicines. I need them, you know, I, I, I would not live without them. Is there any hope for me? And indeed there is. There's always hope, there's always a way. Mrs. Eddy addresses this kind of situation beautifully here on page 485. She, she, taught, she, she wrote, emerge gently from matter into spirit. You know, emerge gently from matter into spirit. Think not to thwart the spiritual ultimate of all things, but come naturally into spirit through better health and morals and as the result of spiritual growth. Those are two key words, that's how you do it. So what your goal wants to be over here is to gain faith in spirit, to grow in your understanding of spirit, to grow in your understanding of God and your relationship to God, your worthiness of God's love and care and your ability to be healed spiritually. And what happens is your thought is more and more spiritually enlightened, you will find yourself making this path. You'll start, you'll start walking this path right over to the spirit model. And from what I've seen from experiences, what happens is there will come a point where you're starting to understand that the medicine of truth is the most powerful medicine there is. It's the medicine Jesus healed by. Know the truth that shall set you free. And, and your understanding of God will be getting up to a point where you're really feeling God's power and presence within like never before. And you start to see that this material medicine that you're holding on to is just getting in the way. It's holding you back. And that's the point where you're ready to release it with good effect. And that's key, with good effect. And whoa, into the spirit model you go and experience the full healing power and might of God. Emerge gently, work it out gracefully. And it's between you and God. You don't need anybody else telling you how you have to do it. Okay, All right, another question that will come is, um, well, okay, what about the tough problems, the big ones? 
you know, is it realistic to pray about those or do we just stick to the simple things like when you're feeling down and out? Well, you know, about three years ago, I had a, a woman, a stranger to me, come into my office one day. She had a long list of items that she wanted to pray about and talk about. And so she sat down and we spent about an hour together going through her list of items. And we had a grand time sharing and talking and praying together. And we got to the end of her list and all was well. And she started packing up and then she stopped and she said, oh, wait a minute, there's one more. <laughs> and she sat down, she extends her legs out. She says, this leg is shorter than this leg. And my ankle gets so tight and tense at times, I can't even walk. Can this be healed? And, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, um, maybe we already have enough things to pray about. No, no. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Fleeting thought. No. That's how, so I thought, well, of course, all things are possible with God. You know, I'd say to her, and I said, well, let's just see you the way God made you, where everything's in balance in your life, everything's properly adjusted, everything's the way God designed it to be in the first place. And that was enough for her at that time. And, uh, you know, she packed up and, and, and off she went. And we stayed in touch over the coming weeks. And she made lots of progress on these issues that she was praying about and thinking about. But about three or four weeks later, I got an email that talks about her progress. And then there's the but paragraph. But my leg is still shorter than the other leg. And my ankle is so tight and tense, I can't even walk. I need to walk. Maybe you need to know the background. So she explained to me that when she was 16, she had a horrible ski accident. She had broken her leg in five places. And the orthopedic surgeon said she would always have about a uh, half inch shorter than the other leg and she would just have to deal with it the rest of her life. And this tight ankle she was struggling with, she had been to numerous uh, podiatrists over the last nine years. Every one of them had a different prescription or a different idea of how it could be fixed, but none of them had a solution. And in the end, basically, she was told, you just have to live with it and do exercises every single day of your life. And uh, there, I thought you'd like to know, she said. So um, I said, well, thank you. Actually, this helps give me direction to my prayers. And I, I shot back another email to her, and it wasn't very long. And I said, okay, well, what we want to do is see you from God's point of view as if that ski accident never even happened. And uh, then I go to God in prayer on my own to understand what that really means. And I went through many of these very points that I've shared with you this, this morning, starting right from the truth that God created. She has a whole individuality made in the likeness of God that is whole and perfect right now. And it's never been broken, hurt, or harmed in any way, shape, or form. That's exactly what Jesus would see in her. And that's what we can see in her too. That this picture of evil, all this physical deformity, and all the pain and suffering is a lie. This is not the truth about her. This is not God's plan for her. This is an imposition of the carnal mind that can be lifted right back off of her. And she can experience the healing power of Christ, that Christ is right there right now, helping her feel these truths and experience their healing power and be blessed by them. And we shared back and forth ideas, emails over the coming months. She didn't tell me what was going on, you know, on her end. Um, uh, uh, but what was happening was her leg started to extend over the next four months and she had to make adjustments in her shoe along the way to accommodate it but eventually on July 4th she first came to my office around February July 4th July 4th she calls me she says Evan my leg is the same length as my other leg and all the pain in my ankle is all gone it's healed and there's this, this quiet, and she says, Evan, you have no idea what kind of healing this is for me. This is the first time in over 40 years that I can walk around in bare feet without pain. And she's thriving today, doing super well in her study of Christian science. And boy, can she talk up a storm about how <laughs> Christian science heals. Such a joy to see that power of God at work there. Mrs. Eddie here sums up much of what we've covered this morning, where she wrote on page 450, the Christian scientist has enlisted to lessen evil, disease, and death. And he will overcome them by understanding their nothingness and the allness of God or good. Here you have the two cardinal points of Christian science. One, the nothingness of evil, and two, the allness of God 
good. They work together. You see, both good and evil cannot be in control of this universe, for one would automatically cancel out the other. They're exact opposites, just like light and darkness. And as Jesus Christ proved, God is the light, and evil is the darkness, and the light dispels the darkness. And this is our goal in the Christian Science Prayer, to get such a clear understanding of God's power and presence, of God's allness, that we're able to see, at least in degrees, the unreality of evil and prove it step by step in our human experience. We all have storm clouds coming our way, different forms that we have to deal with, but we must always keep that greater and grander perspective clearly in view that God's power and presence always remains the same. It's always there. And this is the goal of our prayer, to get so clear on that power and presence of God, to allow our thinking to rise right up into the consciousness of truth, into the mind of Christ, into the kingdom of heaven, where Jesus' thought was that that's all we see. That's all we know from God's point of view, where there is no more evil. There are no more storm clouds coming your way. There's just infinite love. As far as you can see, as far as you can feel, as far as you can think. And it's filled with God's order and peace and harmony and love and health and life. All for you to enjoy and express as a beloved child of God. This is the Christian science perspective. And it's a perspective that heals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.